people, we enjoy the spotlight. We enjoy getting the praise and recognition. And so someone who is kind of behind the scenes and out of the spotlight, finding them to play it with enthusiasm was incredibly difficult. And I think he was, he was completely right in that. There's the old saying that says, oh, what grace it takes I cannot tell to play the second fiddle well. And this, again, goes back to the fact that as people, we desire this attention. We desire this recognition. Uh, even people who maybe by their personalities don't enjoy the spotlight, they still enjoy whatever people give them recognition and credit and praise for the things they feel are praiseworthy. This is something that's just true of people, not only in the 21st century, but it was true of people in the 1st century as well. And so this morning, we're going to look at a story with John the Baptist and his disciples. And his disciples were incredibly jealous over the fact that someone else was stealing their spotlight. Someone else was cutting into their praise and their glory. And so John the Baptist's disciples were incredibly jealous, but John had a completely different reaction. And his response could be summed up perfectly just in verse 30, as Scott has already read it. So if you want to look at John chapter 3, verse 30, you get the entire point of what John has to say on the matter. When he says, he, speaking of Jesus, must increase, but I must decrease. So here at the very beginning, before we walk through this passage, I'll go ahead and lay out to you the whole point of everything we're going to talk about this morning. And the whole point is this. Because of who Jesus is, our lives need to be more and more about Jesus and less and less about us. Very simple, very easy to understand, but that's the whole point of this passage. Because of who Jesus is, our lives must, not, not should, not you know, need to be, but must be more and more about Jesus and less and less about us. And ever increasingly so. I think there's a tendency sometimes that we think that the longer we've been a Christian, maybe the less central Jesus needs to be in our lives. Because, well, you know, I've been doing this for 30, 40, 50 years. I think I've got this figured out now. You know, I, I know my Bible well. I'm, I'm spiritually disciplined. And so maybe Jesus doesn't need to be as important in my life anymore. Maybe he doesn't need to be as central. But the reality is that as we grow in our relationship with Jesus, Jesus becomes more and more the center of our lives. He must increase and we must decrease. And so again, everything we look at this morning is going to revolve around that idea. And what we're going to see is there's going to be two results. When a person lives their life more for Jesus and less for themselves, we're going to see two results based on John the Baptist's response and his followers' response. But let's go ahead and walk through this passage together. So we're going to back up to set the, the stage for this, uh, this passage. So back up to verse 22, and it says this. It says, After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing Adon near Selene, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. And so this story we're going to look at this morning took place after the famous John 3.16, For God so loved the world, after Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. It says that Jesus goes out into the Judean countryside, outside of Jerusalem, and his followers were baptizing at the same time that John the Baptist was baptizing. Now, verse 24 looks kind of strange, so I just want to explain it very quickly. It says, for John had not yet been put in prison. Well, that seems pretty obvious. If John is out in the countryside baptizing people, it's pretty obvious that he hasn't yet been put in prison. But the reason why the Apostle John, who's writing this book, makes this note is because Matthew, Mark, and Luke record Jesus' ministry as beginning after John the Baptist had already been thrown into prison. And so the Apostle John, who's writing this story, is just making the point that everything he was recording in this story took place at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, before Jesus' major ministry had begun in Galilee, and before John the Baptist had been thrown into prison. And so that's the stage, that's the setting. Early days of Jesus' ministry in the Judean countryside before John the Baptist had been thrown into prison. And then in verse 25 and 26, we get the problem. This is... The, the crisis that they're dealing with. Look at verse 25 and 26. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. And so this is the problem. More people were talking about Jesus' ministry now than they were John the Baptist's ministry. And John's disciples did not like that at all. 
They enjoyed when everybody was talking about them, when everybody was talking about their ministry. And now all of a sudden Jesus is starting to take away a little bit of their glory and their fame. And they didn't like that at all. And as we're going to see in this story, John has a much different response. But from their two responses, we learn one thing really important. When our lives are more about Jesus and less about us, we're not concerned with who gets the credit and praise so long as Jesus gets the praise. See, John is not concerned with who's getting the credit and praise in his ministry so long as Jesus is getting the praise. And so his disciples are the exact opposite. They have this discussion with this Jewish person, and, and in this discussion, we don't know exactly all that went on with it, but what we do know is that over the course of their conversation, they realize Jesus' ministry has now outgrown theirs, and they were not too happy about it. And you can tell how jealous they were by the fact that they don't even refer to Jesus by name. They just say, that guy out there, John, you know, that guy that you started talking about, look, he's got more people than we do now. We do that whenever we're, we're kind of trying to be passive aggressive towards someone. We won't refer to them by name and just say, that woman or that man or that kid. That's what they're doing here. They're saying, that guy out there, John, look, he's got more people than us now. And there may have even been a little bit of a criticism for John the Baptist because they say, that guy that you started talking about, John, you know, before, we were the only act in town. Nobody else cared about anybody other than John the Baptist and our ministry. And then you start talking about this no-name guy from Nazareth, and now everybody's going to hear him. No one's coming to hear us, which is probably an exaggeration. They still had people going to John the Baptist. It was just now there were more that were going to hear Jesus. And so this greatly uh, upset them. And it's easy to see why this would upset them when you understand the fact that John the Baptist had a unique role in the history of Israel. You see, for 400 years, there had been no prophets in Israel. If you look at the end of the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi was the final prophet. And then for 400 years, there was silence from God in Israel. And they were waiting to hear from God. They were, they were waiting to, for their Messiah, and yet there was a deafening silence across Israel. But that silence was pierced by a voice crying out in the wilderness, and that voice belonged to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the first prophet in Israel in 400 years, and so he was a big deal. I mean, the crowds flocked to hear John the Baptist, and I'm sure these followers of John the Baptist took great pride in the fact that they were the associates and the disciples, the close disciples of this great prophet. This great prophet who arrived and declared that the kingdom of God was at hand and the Messiah was about to come. And so they took great pride in that. And so now, as Jesus emerges on the scene, they begin to lose that spotlight and that fame. And so because of that, they become incredibly jealous. You know, it's very easy to relate to them. Uh, a lot of times, we like it when we relate to people in Scripture. It helps us understand it better. But there's sometimes we feel like we relate way too easily with someone in Scripture. And I feel like I, I relate way too easily with them because it wasn't just that they were upset that Jesus was being successful. We can rejoice when other people are successful. The problem is, is whenever someone else's success begins to cut into our own success and glory. We can rejoice with a friend who gets a promotion, but when that person gets a promotion over us, we don't like it so much. You know, we, we can rejoice with a friend who gets an award or some accolade, but if it prevents us from getting it, that's when we get jealous. And so as they look out at Jesus' ministry, they realize he's taking away from what we had. And so because of that, they became very, very jealous. But John, as I said, has the complete opposite response. Look at verse 27. John answers, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You see, John realized that everything he accomplished in his life, he accomplished because God had given it to him. God had gifted him with the opportunities, the talents, the abilities. God had blessed his ministry. The reason why John the Baptist's ministry was so successful in the early days when it was the greatest thing in Israel wasn't because of John. It was because it was what God was doing through him. And so John understood that whatever we accomplish in life, we accomplish not because of us, but because it's what God has blessed us with. You will never accomplish anything in life apart from what God is doing in you and through you. you know, there's nothing, you say, well, I've worked hard, I've, I've spent all these years doing this. The reality is, apart from God, we can do nothing. 
And the reason is because God is the one who grants us our very life. He grants us our health, our, our sound mind. He's the one that gives these things to us. And so the only way that we can ever accomplish anything is through God. And see, John understood this. And when you understand that there's nothing we can accomplish apart from what God is doing, there's two results. The first result is this. It kills your pride. There's no room for pride when you realize that the reason you've accomplished this thing is not because of you, but because of what God has done in and through you. So it absolutely kills your pride. John understood the success of his ministry was not about him. There was no reason to be prideful about his success because, again, it was something that God had chosen to do through him. So the first thing it does is it absolutely kills your pride. The second thing it does when you realize that you know, your successes are because of God and take away your pride. When you realize that other people's successes are because of God, it frees you up to rejoice when they succeed. Because it's no longer a competition about who can be better. It's no longer about how I can uh, beat the guy down the street and be better than him. When you realize that the guy down the street is successful because the Lord has blessed him with certain abilities and talents and has blessed him in whatever he's doing, you realize you can take a step back and say, you know what, I don't have to be jealous about his success. I can instead rejoice because I know that this is God that's a source behind this. And see, underlying all of this is the fact that John the Baptist's greatest concern was not his own glory or attention, but the glory of God. And he realized, it doesn't matter whether God is doing it through me and my ministry is successful, or he's doing it with some other guy in that ministry is successful. All that matters is that God is being glorified. And so long as that, John was not concerned with who gets the credit, the credit or praise. What his concern simply was, was whether God was being glorified. Now that's really, really easy to say. That's really easy to say, man, we should be all about the glory of God and, and making much of his name and not much of ourselves. But it's incredibly difficult to actually live that out. So let me, let me kind of paint a picture for you and, and let you think about this. I want you to imagine for a moment a great revival breaks out in Mesquite, Texas. I mean, a revival that rivals the, the greatest revivals of the Old Testament, the New Testament, church history. I mean, thousands of people are being saved. Our city is being transformed. Our, our drug abuse and cr violent crime and problems in our homes are just fading away. Our, our schools, our homes, our streets are safer. I mean, something dramatic is happening. And, and the most important thing is that God is being glorified and sinners are being saved. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that should excite you a lot. And if it doesn't excite you, then I leave that between you and the Lord. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, that should make you very excited to see God glorified and God being worshipped throughout our community. Now, I want you to still be picturing that in your mind, but let me add one other piece of information. First Baptist Mesquite plays a very small role in that. There are other churches in our community who reap the benefits in terms of members, in terms of attendance. First Baptist Mesquite plays a very small role in this great revival. Are you still just as excited? Because if you're not, the reality is you're cutting out a little bit of room for glory of something other than Christ. You're reserving a little bit of glory for yourself or your church. John the Baptist didn't have that problem. John the Baptist was fading into the background and he was completely content with that wine because he was not concerned with his own glory. He was concerned with the glory of God. And I'll tell you, I would love to be able to stand before you this morning and say with 100% certainty that I would be just as excited if a great revival broke out of the feet, but our church played a small role. But I think I know myself well enough to know I would probably be a little disappointed. I, I would want my ministry, frankly, I'd want our church's ministry to play a bigger role. But the reality is, as I say that, that's because I'm reserving a little bit of glory for myself. And John the Baptist does not have that problem. John the Baptist gladly takes a step back. He gladly decreases so that Christ may increase. Why? Because his concern was not over the name of John the Baptist. His concern was over the name of Jesus Christ. And in, in that, he is concerned with glorifying Jesus and not himself. And so the first thing we see in this story is that as we live our lives more and more for Jesus and less and less for ourselves, our great concern is not our own glory, not our own attention, not our own praise. It's the glory and the praise of Jesus. 
The second thing we learn in this story is that as our lives become more and more about Jesus and less about us, we find our greatest joy. So look starting in verse 28 as John continues his, his answer. He says, you yourselves bear me witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. John knew what his role was. John was not confused over the role he was supposed to play. He was not supposed to play the role of the bridegroom. He knew that was a role that was reserved for Jesus Christ. And so John, as he understands his proper relation to God, says he finds his joy. It says his joy is even complete. It's fulfilled. The reality is you're never going to find true contentment and happiness in this life unless you have yourself in the proper relationship to God. Unless you have God at the center of your life, you will never find true contentment and happiness. John understood this, and he gladly stepped back so Jesus can take the center seat of his life. And as a result of that, his joy is made complete. C.S. Lewis, um, and the youth probably get tired of me quoting C.S. Lewis, but I love C.S. Lewis. Uh, he says in his book, Mere Christianity, he says this. He says, all that we call human history, money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empire, slavery, he says all of that is a long story of man trying to find something other than God to make him happy. The reality is if Jesus is not at the center of your life, then you're going to look to try to find a whole lot of other things to put in that place. It may be just yourself, it may be your family, it may be your job, it may be material things. You're going to try to find a whole lot of things to put in that center seat. And the reality is, you're never going to find true joy and satisfaction. Because God, in our proper, having our proper relation to God, as John finds in this passage, until we find that, we don't have our total joy, our total satisfaction. Because only God can do that. One other quote, since I've already got it, one other quote from Jesus Lewis. He says, God made us. He invented us as a man invents a an engine. A car is made to run on petrol or gas, and it would not run properly on anything else. Now, God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn, or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. That is why it's just no good asking God to make us happy in our own way without bothering about religion. God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. And so as long as God is not in the proper place in your life, you're not going to find the satisfaction and joy. And yet, John the Baptist does. Why? Because he takes a step back, he decreases, and he lets Jesus take the center seat in his life. The happiest place for a Christian is doing God's will or God's plan for their life. That is the happiest place for a Christian to be. The most miserable place for a Christian to be is whenever they're not doing what God has planned for their life. John understood that the early days of his ministry, God's plan was for him to have a very, very successful ministry. And he rejoiced in that. He did it gladly. Later in life, though, God's plan for his life was for him to take a back seat. And ultimately, if you keep reading in the other Gospels, God's plan for his life was for him to be thrown into prison. And yet John was joyful in all of that. Why? Because he understood that his goal in life was not to do great things, was not to, to make a great name for himself. His goal was to simply do what God's will was for his life. This morning, the message I have for you is, and this may sound strange, don't desire to do great things. Don't desire to do great things. Desire to do what God has planned for your life. Because if you will do what God has planned for your life, you will end up doing the greatest thing you could have ever done. John understood this. His desire is not to make a great name of John the Baptist. His desire is not to make much of him. His desire is simply to make much of Jesus Christ. And this should be the burning passion of his people. To make much of him and little of ourselves. And so John is willing to play the second fiddle in his own life because he understood it was Jesus' role to play to begin with. John uh, understood, he uses the illustration of, of the friend and the bridegroom and the bridegroom to, to describe his relationship. His job was to introduce people to God. That was the job or the role of John the Baptist's ministry. He was preparing people for the fact that Christ was coming. He was introducing people to him. And so he uses the illustration of the friend and the bridegroom. 
And the job of the friend of the bridegroom or the best man was to simply watch over everything, make sure everything went smooth until the bridegroom arrived, and then the bridegroom and the bride could be together. And in that, he could then rejoice. John understood that his place was not to fill the role of the bridegroom in his own life. If you're trying to fill the role of the bridegroom yourself in your own life, you're not going to be satisfied. It's not until you take a step back and you let Jesus take over that you find that joy. He must increase, but I must decrease. Interestingly, there's a debate among scholars about whether the words of John the Baptist end in verse 30 or if they continue all the way down through verse 36. Most scholars, and I tend to think this is the case, John the Baptist's words end in verse 30. And then John the Apostle, who's writing this book, his words are reported, his commentary is reported in verses 31 through 36. If indeed John the Baptist's words end here, this is the final recorded word of John the Baptist in this book. His final word, his final message is, I must decrease, he must increase. And it's more interesting when you view that John the Baptist is the final prophet in a long line of prophets, stretching all the way back to the Old Testament. And the job of the prophets, they had many jobs. One of the things the prophets were doing is they were talking about that there was this guy who was going to come, this Messiah, this king. And that's exactly what John was continuing that tradition. He was continuing the tradition of the Messiah's coming. And so it's interesting to think of this in terms of all of the prophetic word of the Old Testament and John the Baptist is building towards this single moment when Jesus arrives on the scene and the old prophets fade away to a greater ministry. The old prophets fade away to a greater prophet. Jesus had arrived on the scene, and so John the Baptist faded into the background. John the Baptist decreased because Jesus had arrived, and it was Jesus who was supposed to increase. Now, there's one question we have to answer. As we look at all this, there's one big question. Why? Why should we live our lives more for Jesus and less for ourselves? What is it about Jesus, that makes it that if we live our lives centered on him and our lives for him and not for us, what is it about Jesus that means that our joy will be complete, that we'll find total satisfaction and contentment in life? What is it about this Jesus that makes that possible? Well, I think John the Apostle gives us the answer to that question in verses 31 through 36. Now I'll say we'll move through this very quickly because an entire other sermon could be preached just on these six verses. But we'll move through this very quickly because I think John points out some things about Jesus that's very, very important for us to understand. And so let's read through it. Just so you know, as we read through this, there's a contrast that's being made between Jesus and between John the Baptist and how Jesus is superior. There's also a contrast that's being made between Jesus and everyone else. There's a contrast that's being made between Jesus and between ourselves. Now Jesus is uniquely superior to everyone else. So let's start uh, looking at verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God. For he gives a spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So the first thing I I want to just quickly point out here in these verses is this. Jesus is from God. He speaks as God because he is God. Jesus is from God, he speaks as God because he is God. Look again at verse 31. It says that he who comes from heaven is above all. Jesus' origins, his, where he came from, is radically different than anyone else. Everyone else is, has an earthly origins. And there's a contrast made here between the earthly and the heavenly. And it's not just that the earthly is sinful, although that may be part of it. The idea is that the earthly is just inferior. Jesus has a superior origins. His origins are heavenly and eternal. And so because of that, he is from all, or from heaven. And because of that, he's above all else. He comes from God. He also speaks as God. If you look at verse 34, for he whom God has sent utters the words of God. 
When Jesus spoke, Jesus spoke in a way that was radically different than in the way anyone had ever spoken before. If you go look, for instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, at the end of that Sermon on the Mount, Matthew records the response of the crowd. And the crowd's response is one of, of being astonished and amazed. And the reason is, is because Jesus was one who spoke with authority. They had never heard someone teach and speak in such a way. But Jesus spoke with authority. And if you look at the Old Testament prophets, whenever they would speak for God, they would say, the Lord God says this. Thus says the Lord. But Jesus didn't do that. When Jesus spoke, he just said, I say. Because when he said, I say, that meant the Lord God was speaking. In the Sermon on the Mount, he would say, you've heard it said, but I say. you heard it said, but I say. Jesus was one who spoke with authority. And how could he speak with authority? Well, John tells us, verse 32, he bears witness to what he has seen and heard. When Jesus spoke on subjects, he spoke as one who had authority because he was there. He saw it with his own eyes. He heard it with his own ears. He was there. When the angels sang for glory as the foundations of the world were laid. He, he, he was there when he spoke about the Garden of Eden or, or uh, David or, or, or uh, Sodom and Gomorrah or Noah or Abraham or any of these people. He spoke as one who saw and heard himself. And if you want to know something, you can talk to someone secondhand, but if you really want to understand what really happened, you need to speak to someone who was actually there, who, who saw it with their own eyes, who heard it with their own ears. And Jesus is one who has done that. And so when he spoke on subjects, he could speak with authority. He was speaking as God. It also says, verse 35, or back in verse 34, I'm sorry. It says, for he gives the spirit without measure. You see, in the Old Testament, God would speak through a prophet, and he would give his spirit to his prophet to speak. But it was a limited sense, and it was temporary, and then God would take it back. He didn't give the fullness of the spirit to any of the prophets. But when Jesus came, he came in a different way. He came and had the spirit without measure. There were no limitations to it. Paul in Colossians 2.9 says that the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily in Christ. So when Jesus came, he came as one from above. He came as one from God. He was speaking as God, and it was all because he is God. And so we give our lives to Jesus, make much of him in our lives, a little about ourselves, because he is the one who is above all else. He is the superior being in all of existence, and so our lives should be devoted solely to him. But there's one other thing I want to point out. This is very practical, and this is very easy to understand. Look at verse 36 again. The other reason why we live our lives more for Jesus and less for ourselves is very simple, very easy to understand. It's because Jesus can do something far better than we ever could. Look at verse 36. It says, For whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. We live our lives more for Jesus and less for ourselves because he can do something far superior than anything we can do. He is the one, the only one, who has the means of eternal life. You know, we can, we can brighten someone's day. That's a wonderful thing. If you can ever do that, that's a wonderful thing. Brighten someone's day. Put a smile on their face. But you compare that to eternal life, it, it doesn't mean very much. You know, best case scenario, you can truly change someone's life. You can... You can impact them in a way that truly changes the course of their life. And that is a great and wonderful thing. And we should try to do that. But the reality is when you compare that to eternal life, it really doesn't mean that much. You know, when you take a step back and you view it from an eternal perspective, you realize changing someone's life is just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. It may look nicer, but you really haven't changed the ultimate destiny. And so we live our lives fully for Jesus. We live our lives more and more for him and less and less for ourselves because he is the one, the only one, who has the means of eternal life. How tragic would it be if people were more impressed with who we are as opposed to whose we are? How tragic would it be if people thought more about us than they did about him? Listen, you can think a whole lot in a long time about Matt Scott. It's not going to change anything. Jesus is the only one who can truly make an eternal difference. Why, how pathetic would it be if we live our lives about us, about ourselves, when we have no hope of really changing their eternal destiny, when we have the opportunity of living our lives for Christ? Don't ever let yourself get in the way of somebody getting to Jesus because of your own pride and ego. That is a pathetic thing to do. And we're all guilty of it. I know I am. 
We put our own pride and ego ahead of actually doing just what the Lord wants us to do. John, again, in this story, does not struggle with that. He realizes his life is about something of so much greater value than himself. He realizes his life is not about John the Baptist. His life is about Christ. And so John's burning passion was to make much of Jesus Christ and little of himself. And that needs to be the same burning passion of every one of us here. To make much of Jesus Christ in our lives and little of ourselves. He must increase and we must decrease. And so we live our lives for Jesus because he is the one who is superior over everything else. We live our lives for Jesus because he's the one, the only one, who has the means of eternal life. And when we do that, we find that we're no longer concerned with who gets the credit and praise. So long as Jesus is being praised, the one who actually deserves it. And we do it, and when we do that, we find our greatest joy. And so we live our lives fully and totally for Jesus. The reality is, I want, one final thing I want to point out before we close. Verse 36, I want you to see the stakes here. The stakes are eternal life on one side, the wrath of God on the other. Those are the stakes. How could we live our lives knowing that those are the stakes for ourselves? Knowing we have no hope of changing that dynamic of eternal life and the wrath of God. The only one who can change someone and bring them from the wrath of God to eternal life is Jesus Christ. And so the reality is the one we worship is too worthy and the stakes are too high for our lives to be about anything other than Jesus Christ. And so as we get ready to close this morning, I just want to throw a couple of questions out to you. Who takes center stage in your life? Are you content playing second fiddle in your own life, or are you content with God taking the center stage? Or, or do you want yourself to be at the center stage? When people think about you, do you want them to think about how good you are, about how great you are, about how smart and talented you are? Or do you want them to think about how great your God is? The answer for John the Baptist was obvious. The question is, what about you? Let's pray. Father,